Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallett. Danielle, I have a very special announcement to make. You can now find some of my best shows on the new Roku channel, Mysteria. Both Uncovered with Lorden Arts and Three Men in a Mystery are being aired regularly on channel 548. Mysteria runs just like a traditional television channel. No need to search for what you're going to watch next. You can just leave it on all day and watch mystery after mystery. And the best part is it's all free. I just wanted to be the first to tell you, Danielle, because I know it's probably hard working with someone that has all this crazy success all the time. I just, you know, it's... I, I know all about Mysteria, John. You, you do? You're already a fan? No, I'm on there too. What? You can visit the Roku channel.com and just search for Mysteria if you want the big screen experience, get the Roku channel app installed on your smart TV or use a Roku streaming stick. Just start the Roku app and head over to channel 548 on the live TV guide and you'll see <clears throat> me on Mysteria. Oh, and he is there too. Well, thanks. Thanks, Danielle. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go ahead and keep going forward. Uh, it's time to see what happened with the results for our last episode. Episode. There's a D in there, just in case you didn't know, Daniel. <laughs> World's Worst Alibi Part 2. Danielle told the story of a Man. woman who thought the best way to cover up a hit and run was to head right for the mall and get to some shopping. Absolutely. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. I told the story of a YouTuber who faked an entire six hour live stream to give him an alibi for pulling off a murder. How did it all play out, Daniel? All right, you guys, honestly, not to my shock. On Twitter, I received only 27% of the votes and John received 73%. Ooh. And then he just whooped me even more on the website poll. I received 26% and John received 74. <sighs> honestly... This does not come as a surprise. That was an absolutely insane alibi. The effort that that man went to to try to cover up the awful thing that they're claiming he has done, which, by the way, again, no conviction or anything yet. The trial's not started, right, so I don't want to say right. too much. But yeah. holy crap. Yeah. I almost don't feel good about this win. It's such – I mean, the story is just a terrible, terrible story. Um, just to give everyone a quick update, the trial for Steven is still likely months away from starting, but I am obviously hoping that we do see justice for Natalie McNally's family sooner rather than later. Um, so, I but I got to pass over my beloved mug. <laughs> please do. I haven't seen it in a while, Danielle. It's been a long time. It has. It's been a while. I cleaned it for you. There's not as much dust. Oh, good. Thank anymore. you. Thank you so much. There we go. Yeah. No dust. Mm. <laughs> A little throat coat. I like it. There we go. Oh, oh throat coat. Goodness. Well, today we're heading to the land down under. Oh my God. Don't I'm not I'm gonna impeccable accent. Yeah, I'm gonna try to not do the <laughs> accent too often, but it's hard. It is hard. We're gonna see if we can find some crimes from Australia. And based on some of the laws down there, you guys, we have a lot of potential for today's stories. Okay. There's a lot of crazy Australian law articles online, and many have been debunked, but we've dug in deep and believe these are all actually true, including it's illegal to own more than 50 kilograms of potatoes in Western Australia. That's only 110 pounds of potatoes. Are you growing potatoes, Daniel? Mm -hmm. Yes. I may or may not have an illegal amount of potatoes <laughs> in my cabinet right now. Luckily, you're not in Western Australia. I think you're okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. my goodness. Did you know that it's against the law to disrupt a wedding or a funeral in South Australia? You could face a $10,000 fine or even two years in prison. Honestly, I kind of I kind of support that. Do they but do also, you think they do the uh, the whole thing where you can interrupt the wedding for like, you know, or forever hold I your assume peace? Not. I guess not. No right? one's no one's saying a word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If anyone, Nobody. yeah, if anyone should say why these two shouldn't be together. <laughs> then there's a police officer waiting for you outside. <laughs> right. Here's your $10,000 fine and two years in prison. Wow. Yep. Also, this one gets me. It's an offense in Victoria to fly a kite to the annoyance of any person in a public place. <laughs> Just to someone's annoyance? Like someone? Mm -hmm. Oh, they'd be in trouble if I was around, Danielle, because I am just easily annoyed by kites. <laughs> 
God, look at those children over there having fun. Look at it all bouncing around in the sky like it's important. Also in Victoria, it's illegal to correspond or do business with pirates. Dang. You can't even send them a letter. <laughs> Taking all the fun out of everything. Good grief. Now, did you know it's illegal to offer a reward, no questions asked, for the return of stolen property? Ooh, I kind of like that one because it'd be weird for someone to steal something and then get money for yeah. stealing it and then give the item back, uh, oh especially if they are if they're a pirate. But you're now making criminals out of people mm -hmm. who might have actually been victimized. Because what if like, hey, you know, my, my exactly. daughter's bike got stolen. I go on Craigslist and I'm like, no questions asked. I'll give you 50 bucks. Just bring her bike back. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that one. Uh, here's one for you. It's illegal to be drunk in a pub. Hmm. Well. It makes things a little difficult. <laughs> it does. Uh, I actually looked into that one a little more. It sounds like there was some more specifics I needed to drill into. It's actually, if you're visibly drunk, it's illegal for someone to serve you or to give you more. Okay. Um, but eh. it does still kind of lead to the same thing. Like, you know, if you go to a bar and you have a couple, uh, I, I would assume that you could be visibly drunk. I don't know. I don't know. Good grief. Now, John, this one's perfect for you. Okay. Okay. Under Section 13 of the Vagrancy Act of 1966, anyone who claims or professes to say the future slash fortune by using palmistry or any other type of witchcraft to discover the location of lost or stolen property can be found guilty of an offense. So stop all of your witchcraft that, shenanigans that, if you go to Australia. That is right up my alley, isn't it? But I kind of don't get it because it's either that they don't believe in, yeah, that either they don't believe in psychics and they want to charge someone that yeah. they believe actually has information about a crime, mm -hmm. or they do believe in psychics, but they don't want them spilling the beans on theft. I'm confused. <laughs> me too, Danielle. These laws are absolutely <laughs> hurting my brain. Please tell me a story and make the pain go away. Let's hear our first Australian crime story told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. Tell us, Danielle, what's the John Dory? Who's John Dory? Are you a few stubby short of a six pack? Now, oh I, that goodness. one sounded like I was Canadian or something. I don't know what's going on. That one did sound a little, it had a Canadian <laughs> little twinge to it. Listen, there's a reason why I don't attempt these accents on our show. <laughs> I shouldn't either, but for some reason, I can't I, help you myself. You would sound like a professional. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, buckle in because this is a wild ride. And there is actually, I'm pretty sure, a movie made out of it. Ooh. I think it's like one of those like home done movie type of things. But there is one because this is hard to wrap your head around. Okay. So the summer of 1935 was a very rough one for beachgoers in the suburb of Coogee. Now... Took me a while to figure out how to pronounce that. It's spelled C O O G E E. And I was like, Coogie. Coogie. <laughs> Coogie. But we got it. Now, Coogie is typically no well known for its white sand, beautiful bay, absolutely beautiful waters, you guys, close proximity to Bondi, amongst many other things. But this particular summer, all those years ago, Coogie Beach and nearby beaches were known for something very different shark attacks. Ooh, okay. Now, being off the coast of Australia, shark attacks obviously are not unheard of, but in those recent months, there had been one after another after another, with three men actually completely killed by these shark attacks. And so as the news does, it clung to these stories, scaring tourists and locals alike. I know me personally, every time before I go to the 4th of July, like beach trip for my family, mm -hmm. there's always been a great white shark. <laughs> They're like, oh, and I'm like, do they plan this? They plan this around my trip. <laughs> Just scare me every time. And so obviously everyone wanted to finish their summer vacation there. But with this lingering fear of stepping foot into the ocean, there just weren't as many people as normal. And this wasn't the only blow to the area at the time. So Kuju Pier had been one of the other prized locations to visit there after a day in the sun. They had a huge theater, an arcade. I mean, just like one of those places you love to go after, you know, baking yourself on the beach all day long. Mm -hmm. And so the area was usually bustling, but the pier, for some reason, had recently been demolished. And so this was enough to halt foot traffic in the area. So you've got this issue going on, you've got the sharks. And so less and less people would end up stumbling across the remaining Kuji Aquarium, which was like the last of the remaining attractions. You didn't miss it, but like also I feel like it's one of those things where you don't 
always purposely go to an aquarium. Yeah. Like I know at, at, at least where I am at the beaches, the aquariums are always like in the middle of like attractions because it's like, oh, let's spend some time here to cool off. Right. Now, Bert Hobson, the owner of the aquarium, was feeling this impact of decreased tourism from the demolished pier, the fear of the ocean, and he was desperate for something that would draw people in. But at this point, he's stumped on ideas of what would gather interest until an unexpected fishing trip. Okay. So Bert was fishing just offshore with his son, Ron, in mid-April of that year, trying to enjoy this time with his family, get his mind off of this fear of losing his business, obviously. But as if the ocean heard his desperate calls, he reeled in a small shark. Okay. And so this in itself was obviously mesmerizing for Bert, who loves the oceans and all of its creatures, obviously. But it took it a step further because suddenly that smaller shark is then yanked under. And so confused and curious, they're like, let's take a closer look. And ended up face to face with a 14-foot tiger shark. Ooh. Ooh, okay. I know. Even hearing that, yeah. puts like hairs up the back of my neck. Tiger sharks scare me yeah. <laughs> so bad. Mm. Now, after eating the smaller shark that they had originally caught, this massive tiger shark was now tangled in the line. And so Bert is now faced with two options. Cut the line and save the large tiger shark or bring it to shore. And immediately, Bert turns to his son and was like, this is our new attraction. The tiger shark? He's going to pull the in the tiger shark. <laughs> for the aquarium? What? Like he's going to put it in a pen and, and keep it alive? Mm -hmm. and what the? Okay. Instead of turning away from this fear that everyone in the area was having, he's like, I'm going to turn into it. The obsession around sharks on the coast had grown. And this would be a way for people to kind of face a shark themselves. You know, these monsters that the media had been telling about them for months. Burton know or knew that curiosity always gets the best of people. Yeah. It's like we're drawn to these things. Sure. And so he pulled the shark into shore and released it into an exhibit at the Kuji Aquarium. And just as he expected, word spread and hundreds of visitors poured through the doors. Wow. Tourists and even locals went into a frenzy. They were trying to get their eyes on the shark. I think mainly because it was taken just off their shore. And so they're like, this is one of those that are out there. Right. Like maybe – this one was involved in one of the attacks. We want to see what it looks like. What are we facing? That sort of thing. And the tiger shark, wild as all get out, definitely gave everyone a good show. Yeah. But Bert was most looking forward to Anzac Day on April 25th, which is like a day of remembrance for Australia and New Zealand. Think like Memorial or Labor Day here. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and so while he had drawn in quite a few visitors so far, the holiday usually brought in a lot of people towards the coast. So he's thinking, this is it. Everyone's going to see all these people here, and then they're going to flock here. And so when the beach ended up filling that day and tickets were flying for the shark exhibit, he was thrilled until around 4 p.m. that day. The busiest day they had had in, like, forever, which just makes the coincidences around this mind-boggling Employees at the aquarium had started to notice the tiger shark behaving strangely. Okay. It had a voracious appetite the past like week or so it had been there. Instead of darting around the enclosure, it was sinking to the bottom. It now didn't want to eat. It was moving in unnatural ways and appeared to be in some sort of distress. But from my understanding, they had no idea what they were doing with the shark. And so they're just like keeping an eye on it, trying to see what's going on. Now, as confused onlookers carefully watched, the shark suddenly began to spew things from its mouth. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> I know. I'm trying to be very vague on the description because it, like, made my stomach turn. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but first came a bird, and then a rat, and then a human arm. Whoa. Okay. Shock did not even begin to cover it. And everyone at this point, think of their mindset. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, this is it. This is what we've been warned of. It's a man-eating shark. The shark literally just regurgitated someone's arm, freaking out. News of this human arm hit the headlines, as I'm sure you can imagine. They're just having a heyday with all of the shark news, and speculation was running absolutely rampant. But the reality in my opinion at least, is so much worse than what they originally believed. 
So after local authorities, which I can picture this now, managed to fish the arm out of the aquarium with the shark still in there. Mm -hmm. Have you? Yeah. It was sent to the coroner to hopefully confirm the cause of death and the identity of the victim. It had been found that this arm was likely in the stomach of the shark for at least a week to potentially around 18 days. Okay. Tiger sharks apparently have notoriously slow digestive systems. And so in this case, it actually worked to their benefit because it helped to preserve the arm well enough that the identity of this victim was definitely possible, finding the identity. Wow. But this arm had not been ripped off in a brutal shark attack, as everyone had suspected. There were clear signs that the shark had actually swallowed this arm whole. And the arm had actually been precisely cut off of someone's body. Oh, no. No. Whoever this person was, yes, they had been murdered and then thrown into the ocean in hopes that sharks would take care of the rest. A human was behind this. Wow. Not a man-eating fish. Wow. Wow. So if that were me, I'd be like, man, it's coming from all sides. on land in the water. Like, how do you trust any of this? Yeah. And while an arm doesn't really seem like much to go on when it comes to identifying someone, especially when we're talking back then, thankfully. Yeah. In another crazy turn, this person had a very distinct tattoo on this arm. It was two men boxing. Now, a man named Edwin Smith was reading one of the many articles about this and the horrifying experience at the aquarium, statements from people who were there and witnessed this happen, but nothing prepared him for the realization that he would make. After taking in all of the brutal details that occurred on Anzac Day, he began to read the description of the victim's arm. And the tattoo had his heart sink. This arm belonged to his brother, Jimmy Smith, who had been missing for a few weeks at this point. So fitting perfectly into the timeline now jimmy apparently was a lightweight boxer or he had been which explains the tattoo and he had dreamed of making it big but those dreams seemed to remain just that like nothing more than that sure so jimmy was pushed to find other ways to make money and fill his time and unfortunately it led to jimmy running with a very questionable crowd um, which actually in turn led him to have a few stints as an informant for both authorities and criminals. So he was just mm. in a very interesting position. Mm -hmm. Now, Jimmy had last been seen the night of April 7th, drinking outside of the Cecil Hotel. What? Different one. Uh, <laughs> it's a different one. Don't uh, worry. <laughs> I, was get, I was getting my jacket ready. I was going to fly like, out. Hold on. Yeah. I got another Cecil <laughs> Hotel to go visit. <laughs> uh, but he was he was out there with a man named Patrick Brady. After a night filled with drinks, cards, dominoes, what have you, Jimmy was never seen again. Mm. But authorities knew the name Patrick Brady, and it did not mean good things. So Patrick Brady, an ex-convict, and the last to be seen with Jimmy, was dangerous in his own right, but he also was known to be in cahoots with a man named Reginald Holmes. <laughs> I have to say his name like that. Yeah. There's no other way. Now, apparently, in the years prior to Jimmy's death or murder, Jimmy had been taking on these random jobs to get by because that boxing career just fell through. And so one of these jobs led him directly to both Brady, the ex-convict, and Holmes. Now, Holmes was a big name in the area because he was a boat builder, and he actually was known for his insane speedboats. And so he raked in tons of money with that. But that wasn't all that he was known for. He was also known in the underground crime world. Oh, no, Danielle. It's all falling into place. Yeah. <laughs> he would mainly use his boat building shop on the coast to cover for other nefarious activities, usually drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. So those speedboats that were made so dang fast, it was so that Holmes and his revolving door of employees, including Jimmy and Patrick Brady, could dart to the ocean to pick up a new shipment of cocaine, Amongst other things. Wow. Oh, yeah. And when he wasn't dealing with drugs, he was carefully crafting insurance scams, including one that Jimmy Smith allegedly had helped on and ultimately caused to fail. So this seemed like a possible motive. Now, Holmes had created apparently this huge, brilliant scam to sink one of his most expensive yachts. It was this big thing with the hopes that he could pocket a lot of money because he had some crazy overinsured policy on it. Mm -hmm. Now, Jimmy Smith had been given the job of sinking the yacht himself. 
But he also apparently spoke to authorities afterward. And instead of telling them that this was some freak accident, like he had been instructed, he apparently messed up and said that the sinking was, quote, suspicious. Uh. And this was enough for the scam to fail. And ultimately, Holmes had to pay for the entire boat. Uh Like, just ate all of that money and some, which obviously infuriated him. Yeah. And so now the idea that Jimmy was potentially dismembered and thrown to sharks wasn't seeming like some crazy random homicide as much as it's like, this is an organized hit. So to make that even crazier is the fact that if it was an organized hit, that means that by some crazy chance, Mm -hmm. a random fisherman Mm -hmm. (laughs) goes out into the ocean, catches a shark, the big shark comes, eats the little shark, ends up in the aquarium and in front of literally dozens of people as it regurgitates Jimmy's arm. (laughs) That's perfectly preserved. That's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, the odds, just the odds that of catching the shark, let All alone, the ocean, yeah, let alone it being the guy that has the aquarium. Like, there's so many things like, coming together. Absolutely wild. Wow. So rumors kind of began to swirl about the night that Jimmy went missing. Authorities were already looking into everything, and it ended up being uncovered that Patrick Brady, that ex-con, had rented a cottage that night off of Tolumbi Street, which was odd. What was the purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. After they enjoyed a few drinks and games, they had gone back to the cottage. And from there, Jimmy wasn't seen again. And so the agreed upon theory was that Patrick Brady got Jimmy drunk, lured him to the cottage, and killed him more than likely four homes to get back at him for ruining this insurance scheme. And they were able to find other witnesses to come forward to suggest this as a possibility even more. So apparently a taxi driver had been called to the cottage in the hours after it was believed Jimmy had been murdered. And this taxi driver claimed that he picked up Patrick Brady. Brady apparently looked incredibly disheveled, and Jimmy, who should have been with him, was nowhere to be seen. And the taxi driver claimed that he was instructed to drop Brady off at none other than Holmes' house. Mm. Mm-hmm. So authorities at this point are like, okay, yeah, we see the game plan here. And so they immediately bring in Holmes and Brady for questioning. Obviously, very uncooperative. They both remained adamant that they were not involved. Holmes even tried to say he had no idea who Patrick Brady was, which authorities are like, "Mm, it's a lie. (laughs) Yeah. So at this point, they're like, okay, we don't have much in terms of evidence. Like we've got this arm, but like, how do we prove any of this? What do we do? And so they knew, okay, if we can get them in and question them harder, maybe we can get them to confess. But What do we arrest them on? Well, they're criminals. I'm sure there's a lot. So sure enough, they ended up arresting Brady on forgery charges. And so they brought him in and questioned him for six hours. And the truth came out. Brady ended up confessing that Holmes had, in fact, plotted to kill Jimmy Smith for revenge. But still, they didn't have enough evidence. And Holmes was not talking. And so as they're trying to figure out what to do, something else crazy happens. (laughs) That just made Holmes look that much more suspicious and also has me saying, what on earth? What planet? Okay. So I guess because things were narrowing in on him, on a whim, Holmes is like, okay, I'm getting in my speedboat and I'm racing off into the ocean, liquor (laughs) bottle in hand. Okay. He's just flying through the ocean, holding this liquor bottle, causing a scene He was screaming something about Jimmy being dead and something about there's still one more. And I mean, just going on and on and on. And there's tons of people on the water like, what is this man doing? And he eventually ends up stopping his boat mid-ocean and attempts to end his own life. Whoa, whoa. But he grazed his forehead and that's it. Uh. So he essentially knocked himself unconscious. And as he's tumbling forward to the water... His ankle gets wrapped up in a rope. And he's literally just dangling above the surface, preventing his drowning. (laughs) I know. Wow. Like, what? (laughs) Yeah. It's like fate did not want to let him off. Just like, no. No, absolutely not. It's like, uh, we're not doing this right now. You're going to face face something for this. Wow. Now, Holmes eventually came to. And at this point, he's hearing sirens just absolutely roaring his way. So he manages to get himself up. He sets off on his speedboat. And now there's just this wild chase with authorities in tow. Ultimately, he was captured after being cornered in the Sydney Harbor. And so finally in custody, they're like, all right, we already got the information we wanted out of Brady. We've got to question him and get Holmes to break. 
And sure enough, he ends up confessing that he did have information on Jimmy's death, but it was not what they were expecting. He said that he was not behind the scheme. In reality, he was actually a victim of it all. So according to Holmes, Patrick Brady was behind all of this, and he had acted alone. And it wasn't until Brady showed up at his house that night when the taxi driver brought him with Jimmy's arm that he realized what happened. I know. <laughs> it's just, you know, how many times, I can't count how many times in my life I've run up against liars and they will mm -hmm. only ever admit as much as they absolutely have to. Exactly. There is no, like, for people that live in that way, there is no benefit to the big coming nope. clean. Like, I think most of us, when we were kids, we had some situation where, yeah, we were trying to fib our way through it. We couldn't. We had to come clean. Mm -hmm. And we had this big outpour of information. Yep. And we felt better after it. For most yep. liars, I, I don't think they ever had that happen. And they no. just, they will only give you as much, only give you as much as you can mm -hmm. absolutely pin on them. And that's it. Mm-hmm. He knew just enough information. Yeah. Now, he claimed that Brady, in a rage, explained that he had just killed Jimmy in the cottage on Tulumbi Street before throwing him in the ocean and then bringing his severed arm as a threat to Holmes. Man. Essentially, he was like, this was an extortion scheme. So Brady, I guess, came with, with this arm and demanded a large sum of money from Holmes and said, if you don't give me this money, then I'm going to use this arm to pin you to Jimmy's murder. This is so clear, you, though, that, I mean, it could have been just as easy for Holmes to say, prove to me you murdered him by bringing me his arm and then I'm going to pay you. Exactly. Like, it's the exact same mechanics. It's the exact same. Now, he claimed that he had been left with the arm as like a reminder. And so he himself, out of panic and fear, threw the arm into the ocean where it must have been <laughs> wallowed whole by this shark. And then eventually the shark was caught, brought to an aquarium and regurgitated it. But authorities accepted this story and charged Brady in the murder of Jimmy Smith. Oh, my good. Well, I mean. I think that's, I think that. I know, I know. I mean, he I is he is the one that murdered him. Words. So, yeah. like, yes, he should be facing the charge there. But if it was ordered by his boss, mm -hmm. he should be facing charges too. I think they knew that Holmes would never admit to anything like that. Yeah. And I think they wanted at least someone to go away for it. And so yeah. they're like, if we can at least get Brady. And so they convinced Holmes to testify against Brady at trial. They're like... That's essentially the deal they gave him. I think they realized that's the best they were going to do with this case. And so Holmes agreed to testify. And authorities were like, you have to because this is all we have. Like, we are relying on your statement. But the day the inquest into the murder of Jimmy was to begin, Holmes was found dead in his car. Had been shot three times. Really? Mm-hmm. Shot three times. So killed by someone else. There's some theories that I'll get into in a moment, but, Ooh. and so now they're like, we don't have any evidence. <laughs> like we don't have any evidence. We don't have our star witness. We've got nothing. Yeah. And so ultimately this case totally fell apart and Brady walked away a free man. Oh my goodness. They had, they had absolutely nothing to keep him. I mean, think about it. Any evidence that they would have, I mean, first of all, if they searched that house on Tulumbee street. With the forensics that existed back then, they're not going to get anything of value. Right, right. Mm. Like, at all, I don't think. And especially when it comes to organized crime and cleaning up after themselves. I mean, it was it was a tricky, it was a tricky situation. Yeah. Um. So, walked away. But the rumors continued to swirl. Now, some believed that Holmes really was blackmailed. There's like two camps in this okay. and that basically to ensure that he couldn't testify against Brady, that a price was put on his head, likely by Brady. And so essentially this promise that Holmes claimed Brady made that he'd be the next victim came to fruition. Hmm. So people are like maybe Brady acted out of pocket, like he was his own person, his own ex-convict. And like it seemed like a situation where he would come in and he would help Holmes, but he still did his own nefarious dealings. Yeah. And so yeah. 
Yeah, it kind of it kind of leads itself to almost to believe what Holmes was saying before that mm -hmm. he was actually kind of victimized in this in some way. Hmm. Yeah. And so and then I'm like, OK, well, if Brady and Jimmy were close enough to be going out together and all these different things, like were they trying to like plan to overtake him? This theory honestly can go and go and go. Yeah. But others believe that Holmes was full of it, that he was the one behind the murder plot after Jimmy had cost him so much money, like a lot of money. And there's even rumors that Jimmy had been blackmailing him afterward. Mm. I don't know anything about that. Um, but when it basically it's saying when he knew that there was no escaping his fate and the truth coming out that this would be the one thing that would like take him and his whole empire he'd created down, that he essentially knew if he went on stand and testified against Brady that so many other things would come out, all these things would happen. So he hired a hitman to take him out. Wow. People are like, well, his first attempt to end his life failed. So maybe he was like, I can't do it myself. I've got to get someone else to do it. This is like the Murdoch case right now. Seriously. <laughs> it's like the 1930s version of the Murdoch case. Yeah. Hmm. So there were all these theories, but regardless, there were never any answers as to what really happened to Jimmy Smith and who was behind his brutal murder. Just this strange set of circumstances that seem unbelievable in a story that legitimately sounds like a movie plot. Yeah, but even a movie you wouldn't believe like you would see these oh, events and be absolutely. like how stupid is that there's no way I that know. bringing in the shark it's and not the, realistic this is so dumb yeah the shark throws up an arm wow wow yeah huge thank you to the dictionary of sydney mental floss grunge.com kooji news wikipedia for all the information on this roller coaster of a story that is so hard to believe hard to believe and still hard to like get my head around like what really happened yeah like there's just these big unanswered questions Mm -hmm. uh unserved justice yep yeah mm. you're gonna, you're gonna have know. me thinking about that one for days danielle i'm telling you yeah. i'm just over here like what are the freaking chances yeah yeah i'm never gonna go to an aquarium again no and i'm sure that those people are really so traumatized i know can like, you imagine like having your kids you there so, yeah and it's just like oh mommy okay. mommy what like is that we, we, Oh no, as if they weren't scared enough of the ocean and sharks. But I think it's interesting though that technically it was found it was not the shark. So like at least yeah, there's that. That's true. That's true. It's just some crazy criminal underworld situation happening in Australia, which apparently is like a big thing, by the way. There's like an influx in organized crime over that way. So mm. Mm. interesting times. Definitely. Well, all I can say to that, Danielle, is there you go, mate. Oh, my gosh. That one was decent, right? That was decent. All was. right. Well, we will be back <laughs> right after this short break. When the spring sunshine is calling your name, don't call for takeout. Don't reach for the Vegemite, mate. Get HelloFresh. Their new fast and fresh options are ready in just 15 minutes or less and without that high price tag. Plus, this May, HelloFresh is celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Try limited time, authentic recipes created in partnership with Chef Serbi Sani of New York City's Tagmo restaurant and enjoy a cultural taste tour right in your own kitchen. The options just never run out, Danielle. HelloFresh can please everyone at your table from fit and wholesome to pescatarian to veggie. They have a meal plan that suits your lifestyle. I recently have Parmesan crusted chicken with creamy tomato and lemon spaghetti. The tomatoes tasted like summer. The lemon and the sauce absolutely brightens up the pasta. Plus, the chicken was super crunchy and delicious. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Crime After Crime 16 and use code Crime After Crime 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Enjoy spring by spending less time in the grocery store. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Crime After Crime 16 and use code Crime After Crime 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Try America's number one meal kit today. Do they have it in Australia? If they did, it'd be Australia's number one meal kit also. Either way, <laughs> you're going to love it. All right, you guys. Welcome back. It's time for John's story. It is, and boy, you gave me another doozy to follow up. There is no um, no shark throwing up arms in my story. Okay. <laughs> but there is a very cool name, Daniel. 
Star Force. Okay. Now, this is unfortunately not a sci-fi story. Kind of wish it was, but uh, it sounded like for a minute. I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) It's it's still a pretty cool story. And you know what? I think I focused a little more on the on the heroes in this story, and I think you'll you'll see why. This is I appreciate that. Yeah, this is the story of South Australia's biggest siege. Okay. It took place in 1994 in the beautiful Barossa Valley, just about 37 miles northeast of Adelaide. Known as a popular tourist destination, Barossa Valley is a major wine producing region. And with that comes beautiful picturesque views, great food, and plenty of outdoor activities. Though they do specifically ask, please do not walk amongst our vines. And for good reason. Mm. They specialize in Shiraz and have some of the oldest Mm. Shiraz vines in the world, with some of them being planted over 150 years ago that are still used in active commercial production today. That's crazy. Isn't that insane? That's really crazy. But in Barossa, they also produce Rieslings, Semignon, and Cabernet Sauvignon. And I worked on those pronunciations as well. I was about to say, I can tell it was great. (laughs) Uh, It was weird because I looked up one and it was like, Semillon, Semillon. I'm like, no, it. That's not how you say it. You're like, this isn't right. No, incorrect. Semillon. Semillon. The wine. (laughs) Uh, The wine industry is the main source of employment for many residents there. As a matter of fact, every two years they have a wine festival that brings in people from all over the world, and it lasts an entire week. Sign me up. I was about to say I need to plan my next vacation. Seriously. Sounds like a great place to visit. Mm-hmm. And you'd think with all that wine around, people should be pretty chill there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You'd think. Mm-hmm. But they're not, apparently. Mm. John's like, ha, ah, nope. Well, not this guy. On the north end of the Barossa Valley is a town called Nriup Nriupa. Now, that one's tough. Yeah. I'm going to try it again. Nriupa. Yeah, it's something. I like think that. that sounds right. It, yeah, Nriupa. Third time's a charm. With a population (laughs) of only 6,500 people, it's home to several well-known wineries, and it literally has vineyards surrounding the town. Mm -hmm. Now, Senior Constable Derek McManus arrived at a home to serve a court summons. He worked for one of the coolest law enforcement division names I have ever heard of in my life. You know what I'm going to say. Star Mm -hmm. Force, Danielle. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm a cop <laughs> for Star Force. Star stands for the Special Tasks and Rescue Force. Okay. They would actually later change their name to Star Group, which is not as cool and sounds a little corporate-y, but- I was about to say, I don't- But I kind of appreciate, appreciate that. it. I, I do because- I don't. They've <laughs> dropped. <laughs> they've dropped the use of force- Okay. Get it? All right. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and I get it now. It kind of, honestly, it kind of makes sense. I've seen some footage of them in training. And mm-hmm. basically, they're a lot like we would see like for a SWAT team out here. Ex- okay. Except for one major difference. Star group members rarely have to fire their weapons. Now, okay. they will take out armed suspects if there are absolutely no alternatives using force. But a lot of the time, they're bringing that guy in. And Senior Constable McManus certainly knows a bit about that. He was awarded a police bravery medal just five years prior when he and his partner wrestled a gun away from a man who was actively shooting at them. That, that's something else. That's Star Force. That right there is Star Force. Isn't that amazing? Dude shooting at you and you and your partner work your way up to him and get him down and get the gun away from him and take him Majority in. Majority of people are going the other direction. Yeah. 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 Um. He had also been given an Australia Day Young Citizen of the Year Award in 1992 for his decades of volunteer community service. This is a guy that was just giving, giving, Mm -hmm. and a family man on top of that. So McManus and a small squad of officers from Star Force (laughs) arrived at this rented farmhouse of 37-year-old Tony Grosser. Now, I don't know if he actually pronounces it like that. He probably says Grosser, but today... I'm going, For the sake of the story. <laughs> I'm going with Grocer. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> it's been settled. <laughs> That's right. Tony Grocer, described as a known fraudster. He was facing 197 counts of fraud, totaling over $70,000 in stolen funds and 
he forgot to show up for court, Danielle. Just fails to show mm -hmm. up to face these charges. So McManus and his team were there. They were planning on giving Tony a shiny new pair of bracelets. You know what I'm saying? I sure do. I'm mm -hmm. picking up what's thrown down. Mm -hmm. They were going to mm -hmm. arrest him, just in case you didn't know. I'm just going to spell it out in the script. There. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to arrest him. And even though Star Group, know, they knew Grocer's history <laughs> of violence. And they planned for that possibility. Things, okay, good. things did not go according to plan at all. Mr. Grocer, it's the police, McManus said at the front door with a knock. There was no answer. He began moving around the building, calling out that they wanted to speak to Tony Grocer. Still no answer. McManus kept moving around the house. He was about two feet from a sliding door and gunshots start ringing out. Oh, no. One, two, three, eight, nine, ten. Just going. Even more. There's footage taken from one of the officers. They had a guy with yeah. a camera, basically. Thankfully, he was at a safe distance for all this. You could just hear. It's like pop, 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 pop. It is just, and it just doesn't stop. Just, Intense, yeah. And from the footage, you can't tell who's shooting at who. But a moment later, you hear McManus yelling out, I'm hit, I'm hit. Oh, no. He wasn't just hit, Danielle. No. Grocer had fired 18 shots from a Chinese assault rifle within five seconds, and McManus had been struck 14 times. Holy crap. And he's still alive. Dude lands on his back, has his gun, pulling up his gun. Yeah. <laughs> he's afraid that he's going to shoot himself in the foot, and if he did all his friends at the force would make make fun of him for shooting himself <laughs> after he's been shot and he's like i know like the thoughts that would go through your mind right like what's <laughs> dang the, i can't shoot myself yeah in the i'm afraid i'm gonna shoot myself in the foot uh yeah he somehow <laughs> drags himself off to an outside corner of the home he finds mm -hmm. this kind of spot where he's protected but he's severely wounded and some of those shots happened after he was on the ground like he he's he's getting shot more by this guy um but he pulls himself That's away nice. He's protected, but severely wounded. He had broken bones, yeah. severed arteries, Ooh. and another big problem, the shootout was still going on. Those shots, boom, 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 boom. They just still keep going. going. Yeah. How are they going to get emergency services to him in time to save his life? And how are they also going to stop this insane assault from Tony Grosser? Yeah, because he sounds like he would absolutely do that to many more people. <laughs> Basically, yeah, uh, he was hunkered down in the house. He had mm -hmm. three high-powered rifles that included armor-piercing capabilities. Uh, he had literally thousands of rounds of ammunition. He was using a chimney that was on the roof as kind of his lookout. And basically, it was his sniping spot. If he saw anything moving outside around, he was cracking he shots it. at it. Yeah. So McManus knew that help wasn't going to get to him easily. He had to try to no. get out of there. So even with his broken bones, his severed arteries, he manages to get to his feet. He was going to get himself to help, but it just wasn't going to happen. Basically, he yeah. tried to stand up and he just went, he just crumpled. He went right back down. He was just losing too much blood. Mm -hmm. He kept his pistol in his hand and he would frequently take his finger off of the trigger and flex and bend it to make sure that it was still working because he's losing blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's like, can I even still shoot this if I need yeah. to? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, yeah. what if Grocer decides that he's going to come out and finish exactly. him off? Exactly. So he's just thinking, I just got to keep this gun workable. Um, but there was yet another problem. McManus was starting to slip in and out of consciousness. Oh, no. Never know. Honestly, surprised that he even lasted to that point. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Oh. Take, taking that many shots, pulling himself away, trying to get up, falling exactly. down. Exactly. Um, yeah, he was basically slipping in and out of consciousness, never knowing if the next time he passed out could be it like that, yeah. that could be the last, uh, more police from star group were arriving. Um, this unit is used to dealing with emergency situations that might involve yeah. rescues, sieges and armed officer situations. This occurrence, all of that stuff and more going on. And Grocer wasn't stopping his assault. The ground outside the farmhouse was literally becoming riddled with bullets. Star Group knew McManus had been hit and they had to figure out how to get him out of there. 
Dr. Bill Greeks from the Royal Adelaide Hospital was brought onto the scene, but police were struggling trying to figure out how to get McManus to yeah. the doctor. So they decided, well, if we can't bring him to the doctor, maybe it's time for a house call. Oh my gosh. A team of officers and Dr. Greeks made the move. While several provided covering fire, Dr. Greeks and a handful of officers finally reached McManus. He'd been laying there for nearly three hours when the team no! arrived. No, I was picturing not at all that much time. Three hours he was laying there, Danielle. So, no wonder they were like, forget it, we're going in. Like we're yeah. doing what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to leave their guys behind like that. Absolutely not. Uh, Dr. Greeks describes laying next to McManus for 10 minutes while bullets literally flew over their heads. Quote, in retrospect, we probably shouldn't have been in there. He would later tell the press. Well, yeah, probably not, but. <laughs> yeah, but you did. Uh, wh yeah. When they got to McManus, Dr. Greeks saw that he was white as a sheet. There was no sound, no movement. Dr. Greeks checked for a pulse and he was not finding one. Then yeah. he heard a loud gasp. McManus was still alive. Dr. Greeks Holy crap. finally found a very weak pulse. His heart rate was super low. And Dr. Greeks knew that if his heart stopped out there, there was a good chance that they weren't mm -hmm. going to be able to resuscitate him and, and get it started again. Yeah. Uh, they started giving him some fluids while they waited for their chance to pull him out of the scene. Dr. Greeks says that if they would have arrive, arrived only 30 seconds later than they actually did, he's convinced it would have been too late. That's crazy. So thankfully, they did get there in time. They soon found their window to pull McManus out. He was put into an ambulance, finally getting the full medical attention and treatment he needed, including blood. Like they just basically start pumping this guy as yeah, soon as they can. Yeah, doing whatever they could. Yeah. yeah. But the gunfight still going on. It had to stop at some point, right? Well... The shooting, I would hope so. Yeah. The shooting does slow down. Soon, phone contact was made with Grocer and the police. But despite being in contact with them, he didn't have any particular demands. So, just doing it just to do it? I guess. So the standoff just continues. 12 hours, 24, 36. At the nearly 40-hour mark, with an estimated 25 hours. Hundred rounds being fired. I was about to say, where on earth was he hiding all this ammunition? It sounds like he was almost like a like what do you consider a doomsday prepper? Yeah, or something. like a prepper. Yeah, just, has... just loaded, just loaded up with ammo. But thankfully, at forty hours, it finally came to an end. Now, do you think that Star Force or Star Group had to shoot him, Danielle? Nope. The ending of the standoff turned out to be Grocer finally just surrendering himself to police. They kind of waited him out basically like yeah just, just were like all right we'll bring yeah. in new men we'll do what we have to do but yeah. you know eventually you're gonna have to right hand yourself over yeah they're in no kind rush of like that approach. i do yeah. too and it it seems Especially when there's no one else in there that could potentially be harmed yeah yeah it does it does seem um like they they do some different approaches based on like the training and stuff that i saw mm -hmm. uh and just hearing that story about you know they've got someone shooting at them like think about a u.s cop in that situation like Return mm -hmm. fire is is the response out here. Absolutely. Um, yep. So yeah, just a different approach to policing there. Um, Grocer was taken into custody. He faced numerous charges, including attempted murder. Yes, mm -hmm. thankfully McManus did completely survive the ordeal. I didn't doubt that for a minute. Yeah, yeah. For I'm so serious. Like there was nothing in me where I was like, he's already made it this far. There's he's not going down i'm getting chills happening. just even saying this story again and quite honestly i got misty-eyed at one point because i've seen yeah. footage of this man talking about what he went through and uh, oh man it's it's pretty amazing and you're, we're going to see how amazing he is as, as we continue here um grocer decides that he's going to defend himself at trial we, oh not one of these <laughs> we know how those go but get this this trial goes on for 10 months 10 months it cost the taxpayers over three million dollars but he's that's a nightmare john it, can you imagine a trial for 10 months like like an absolute nightmare yeah i mean they had like how did they even manage it I, how did they why did that <laughs> why did like, they allow how did that it even happen i know yeah i don't know but uh he eventually was convicted and sentenced to 22 years in prison but 
I don't want to focus too much on Grocer. The real story here is Derek McManus. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a picture of him post-surgery and Danielle, like he literally, his body looks like the Frankenstein monster. Like every oh my gosh. piece of him is literally stitched back together. It's, it's amazing in one way, but just seeing all the damage that had been done to his body, like it's crazy. Um, that is crazy. I cannot believe he managed to survive that. I mean, I knew he would Yeah. based on like, just one of those things where you get a gut feeling, but I mean, there people don't survive one shot like I that, know. you know, like, I, know. I mean, looking at that many, uh, he says of the ordeal quote, there's only two bullets that I can remember actually hitting me. As I walked up to that sliding door, all I knew is I was falling to the ground. The sound of gunfire oh, was exploding in my ears. I've also heard him describe the two bullets. Basically the two that he remembers hitting him mm -hmm. are after he fell down. And his explanation of being shot and then feeling the bullet hit his leg, he says, it feels like you've been hit by a sledgehammer and there's this wave that goes all the way up through your body, right up to the top of your head. And then it kind of starts calming back down. And then he got shot again, same oh, shock no. wave. Yeah. yeah. So those are the only I two. I mean, at least that was only two and he didn't yeah. experience that every single time. Yeah. I think... I think our brain has a mechanism to try to kind of yeah, yeah. cut out some of that stuff. But uh, And when it comes to his rescue by the star group and Dr. Greeks, he says they knew they weren't fully protected. They risked their lives. And I know. It was sweet. I, doesn't it make you want to cry? Yeah. It's so, so sweet. Um, so much dedication to, you know, like what you're doing and the people that you're doing it with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that makes all the difference in my opinion absolutely he calls them the real heroes which mm -hmm. i think derek is absolutely part of that group uh, oh, yeah. he says that a big part of the motivation for him to stay alive was thinking about other policemen he knew that had lost their lives and seeing their wives and their children that they left behind and he didn't want that to happen to his wife and their three children i was gonna ask if he had said anything along those lines hearing it like what what was in his mind like what pushed his willpower to stay alive and yeah i was curious doesn't it all surprise me that that's what he said yeah he also said that one of the times that he was going unconscious he saw a like he called it the most brilliant white light oh no and he thought oh, that yeah. was it he's like this is this is the one like yeah. i'm leaving this is it what an experience to go through yeah yeah Thankfully, because of all these heroes who stepped up on that day, Derek's family would never have to face that harsh reality. Mm -hmm. Quote, I think Derek is one of the sickest patients I've ever had to look after that has actually survived. Yeah. He almost lost all of his blood. I still don't know how he survived. He's an incredible human being, said Dr. Greeks. Yep. Uh, Derek McManus recovered. And of course, you know these guys, Daniel. He dreamt of someday returning to active duty. Mm-hmm. After several weeks, he was released from the hospital. I'm starting to get, I'm starting to feel emotional again. Man. Oh no. Oh no. These guys, this, I, this was super, super sweet. So yeah. after several weeks, he's released from the hospital. He's able to return home to his family. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Guys from the police force had volunteered their time to go fix up his house. <laughs> and completely redo his yard and everything like i mean the guy went home to like a new oh <laughs> like my a new gosh house. john isn't that These amazing so much <laughs> that's awesome to hear yeah that's just some good people right there yeah yeah uh derek had to relearn how to use his own fingers and he was oh, in geez. physical therapy for numerous mm -hmm. issues but he did finally return to part-time duty only nine months later. And after two and a half years, he went back to full-time, fully operational duty with Star Group. Wow. But his story of survival would give him the framework for another career after law enforcement. He became a, motiva a motivational speaker that would focus mm -hmm. on what he refers to as human durability and believing in yourself. Yeah, how could you not? Like, how could you not want to spread that message after going through something like that? Yeah, well, and what I love about, because I listened to some of his speeches as well, mm -hmm. uh, is he talks about the fact that, like, 
he knew the types of situations he was going to be putting himself into. So yeah, absolutely. It, it was really about preparing himself to be able to handle those types of situations, mm -hmm. like making sure he was healthy, making sure he was in shape, making sure he was well trained, you know, and that in doing all that stuff, you don't focus on the risk necessarily. Just knowing that if I face a tough situation like that, I've got as many tools in place make it it, yeah. to make it through it. I've um, done the best I can, the most I can. Yeah. 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 So it's it's like really literally a, in every sense of it. <laughs> yeah. It's a great approach that that he's putting out there. Uh, he wants to give other people what he what he says in his words, a light at the end of the tunnel and show mm -hmm. them to fight for whatever they want most out of life even yeah. if that's literally holding on to life itself like he did. Mm -hmm. So uh, Grocer served his time and has since been released, but his release didn't come without some controversy. He was electronically monitored in the first use of Australia's High Risk Offenders Act, and he had to agree to other restrictions, including giving up all his weapons, which he had a lot, apparently. Uh, he tried to get the monitoring time shortened, but the courts took issue with the fact that he basically wouldn't admit to having a psychiatric illness. Justice Stanley said, I consider that a substantial period of electronic monitoring is still required before the court can be satisfied that the respondent poses yeah. no realistic risk to the community, given his psychiatric condition is permanent. The respondent's attitude to treatment is of forced compliance. He does not acknowledge that he has a mental illness. The respondent suffers from a paranoid delusional disorder with persecutory beliefs involving conspiracy theories concerning police and official corruption. Those oh, great. Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, this is part of the shootout, right? This is exactly. He's basically yeah. in this mind trap of, oh, they're finally coming for me. I've been getting ready for this, and this is the big showdown. Uh, the judge also said those beliefs have existed prior to, during the siege, and over the 22 years that he was in custody. I did find, I went looking for old articles on this as well, and I found at the Sydney Morning Herald that Grocer had actually claimed to be a police informant at some point, and that he was claiming to, kind of in line with your story, that he was an informant against organized crime and you know, kind of trying to work both sides a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. He also claimed to have handled explosives that were used to kill another police officer, but another man was charged for that murder, so really seems like the delusional aspect is certainly part of this. Um, right before Grocer's release, McManus was quoted as saying, whether Grocer is released or not is really of no concern to me. I don't think about Grocer himself much these days. Yeah, because I mean, oh, good grief. Yeah. Situations like that scare me, and I feel like that's, you can't help the fact that you're dealing with a psychiatric illness. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not something that you can control. Right. But that, oh, this brings me back to like every issue I have with how when crimes come out of that, there needs to be a different handling of said person with psychiatric illness. And so it's, I don't know, I'm like kind of nervous. <laughs> well, I don't feel like that for profit. You're not the only one. Uh, everyone was nervous. Upon his release, Grocer was banned from the entire Barossa Valley. Yeah, sounds the, about right. The whole valley. So you're not coming back here, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. Because it's like how you you can't predict how someone's going to react yeah. to any sort of situation. So there's not much protecting yourself, you know, from him in that area because you don't understand his mindset at the time and what oh boy. Oh, I don't was, blame him. It was a big deal just for them to even put the electronic monitoring on. Because, you know, like the, yeah. the counter argument to that is this is a guy that served his time. You guys gave him a sentence. He served his sentence. Now he's being released. He should be released. Um, so they were already very concerned because they were like, apparently they didn't get the result they were looking for, uh, which would have been him maybe accepting some treatment, maybe rolling into a program that they would offer for yeah, him or something. Yeah, that's what I would hope. Yeah. Um, but no. <laughs> but he, if he's denying all of that. Yeah. Yeah. He does claim that his days of violence are are far behind him. I haven't seen any updates of, of any other acts happening from him at all. But I do want to note, this was an interesting case to review because I'm noticing a very big difference in the press out there and how they handle stories of this nature. Uh, mm -hmm. The stuff that I told you about Grocer is basically all that's known about him. 
Like there's no yeah. big backstory. There's no, and even some of the details about like the police activity and how that stuff went down. Like it is just like the media yeah. out there handles these instances in a very respectful way. Yeah. Like they were really focused very much on McManus, on what McManus's experience was. Um, and that was kind of it. So it that kind of came through, I think, in the script too. Like it's yeah, just yeah. that was the source material. They it's it's interesting because out here you might oh boy. yeah, you might have articles that are focused purely on, you know, five facts that you need to know about grocer. Oh, when he was mm -hmm. a kid, he had this charge. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Like there was none of that around this case. It's it's just interesting to see it's the very differences. Very interesting. Yeah. But a uh, big thank you to the Sydney Morning Herald, A Current Affair, Barossa.com, News.com.au, Yahoo News, the Australian Broadcast Company, Adelaide Now, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story and for maybe making me cry for the first time on Crime After Crime. <laughs> yeah. I think. <laughs> Join the club. I think so. <laughs> I think that's a first. Man, I spend like all my time on here, on you know, our Patreon, on my own personal channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just constantly crying about something. Took you down with me this time. I did have one little afterthought to add about this case. Mm -hmm. Remember that the farmhouse that Grocer had was rented. Mm -hmm. Would you have a shootout and standoff at a place that you're renting? And if you did, do you think you're going to get your security deposit back? <laughs> Definitely not getting security deposit back. <laughs> Especially from the way the front yard was described. Oh, I, I saw like pictures. Green. Like literally, there was just pock marks in the ground. It yeah. was just bullets mm -hmm. everywhere, everywhere. Twenty five hundred rounds. Well, um, and I mean, thankfully everyone survived, so I feel like okay mm -hmm. talking about it. But like, imagine being the landlord, <laughs> and it's like, hi, um, you may or may not have thousands and thousands of bullet holes all. Over. Oh, like, oh yeah oh at one point the police even ran a vehicle like a front loader into one of the walls to puncture a hole John. in it yeah <laughs> you know this house is messed up now <laughs> oh my goodness yeah it's a roller coaster that's for sure mm -hmm. oh but mcmanus puts the man i know in mcmanus uh <laughs> just a really seriously though yeah that's admirable everything that he did just start to finish yeah cool dude and uh you know his his secondary career of being a motivational speaker speaker got him able yeah. to travel the world and see all kinds of different places and yeah nice little follow-up on that um i think it's time for extra stories danielle we need a palate cleanser because we've heard about Sharks Man. throwing up arms and yeah. vicious attacks on police officers. Let's straighten this out. Don't worry. Don't worry. I've got you. All right. So apparently all the cases that I found, these extra ones are all very recent. So I am i don't know what's going on over there, but it's something. Okay. Because in April of this year, which is, you know, just past April when this is coming out, mm -hmm. Authorities in Queensland apprehended a 26-year-old man after public outcry and a long search for doo -doo 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 -doo, a kidnapped platypus. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. Do you have to kidnap platypuses? Can't you just go get one somewhere? <laughs> Listen, that's what it says on their news outlets. Speaking of like the terms and things that they say and the way they report things, yeah. it, this platypus was kidnapped. Okay. All right. Okay. So platypus are a very protected species, okay? And this one in particular, I guess, had been released into a local river in hopes that it would up the population, what have you. Now, a young couple managed to, and they've been not named, which is a note to your comment. Yes. Um, yeah. So they actually went to this river area, managed to find a platypus, and instead of just admiring it from afar, which legally you're supposed to do and come no closer, they said, you know what? This is our new friend. They picked him up, wrapped him in a blanket, and took it on an adventure. Multiple reports from shocked people all over came in saying this couple had taken this platypus on a train ride. Um, you know, they took it to a shopping center. They're just like carting it around in their towel. They're like patting its head like a dog. They're letting people look at it and all of this. And so CCTV actually captured this couple. And ultimately, they were identified. And the man actually ended up being charged with taking a protected animal, which lands you apparently the penalty of almost $300,000. Ooh, man. 
You can't just go I mean, cuddling imagine... platypus like that. No, absolutely not. <laughs> We're taking the amount of a home from you. <laughs> wow. Like, absolutely not. Now, thankfully, the man claimed to have released it back where it got it. So, I mean, they've not been able to prove that for sure. I don't think he had any, oh. you know, intentions of harming it, but... I hope he doesn't have a platypus in his closet or his attic or something. That would be sad. I, I, I genuinely don't think so. Yeah. Because he also learned during all of this that he got very lucky. Because apparently, which I didn't know this either, male platypus are very venomous. Oh, no. I didn't know that either. Like, what? Oh, <laughs> Man, I thought you were going to tell me that they are, they're known to throw up human arms. No, surprisingly, no. Okay. I know that may be an Australian thing, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> this platypus does not do that. They've got like talons or something, and the males only, not the females. I mean, it will hurt you. It won't kill you. It's not lethal. Scratch you and but make they, you sick? Yes, you get very, very sick. It's apparently incredibly painful. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Wild, I'm telling you. Look, platypus, they're one of those things that for a while I like questioned if I made them up. You know how like sometimes there's like an animal or a word that you're like, yeah, is that real? It is. It is an odd looking animal for sure. It is. It reminds me of a Psyduck, like a Pokemon. Yeah. Uh, on top of that animal story, I've got one for you. Apparently there was an old Australian TV show about a kangaroo called Skippy, the bush kangaroo, who would frequently save the day. Well... Now there's a real-life crime-fighting kangaroo, Danielle. Senior Constable Perfect. Tiffany Grieg, who works out in remote areas of the country, drives around with her partner, a kangaroo. Uh, and it's not the first. She, Her first partner, also a kangaroo, was named Quinn. <laughs> and she said, when I got him, he was about a kilogram. He was a tiny little thing, but he was just the funniest, most robust little roo I've ever had, she said. She even took Quinn into pubs occasionally which i saw a picture of a cop you're joking no cop standing in a bar with a kangaroo standing next next to her now she rides around with cornelius who has markings that look very regal according to her and of course of course danielle because we're in 2023 you can yeah. you can find pictures of constable Grieg and cornelius on patrol on instagram just search for Oh, this is great. Yeah, just search for the Outback Cop. And honestly, the pictures are super cute. She kind of carries it around like a baby. She carries it around like the platypus, honestly, the way you yeah. were describing that. <laughs> um, but she does think that it helps her job. Quote, it's about breaking down those barriers. And I think the Instagram account really does that. And obviously carrying around a Joey 24-7 does that yeah. as well. It mm -hmm. encourages people to talk to you and find out a little bit more about you and seek advice. And she does love her job. She says, I get paid to patrol the Outback, and it's just a fantastic experience. Honestly, that's the only job in law enforcement I would take. Yeah. Be patrolling the Outback with a kangaroo. With a kangaroo. <laughs> you just like I going mean, to the bar. Not... Going to the bar with the kangaroo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, she's not wrong, though. Animals, I mean, that's yeah. why they use them for therapy. And we know how I feel about animals. I have like a whole farm. And so I can totally see that you're breaking down barriers. There's no telling what you'll do and, you know, who you'll get to calm down. There's, yeah. you know, scientifically proven this presence animals have about them that chills you out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I appreciate it. It's the most Australian thing I've ever heard. But yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> it is. That's why I've decided to make it the thumbnail. It's pretty. That's a pretty Australian <laughs> thing in my mind a kangaroo wearing a police hat oh my goodness all right now this one again i don't know what's going on over there you guys <laughs> this happened in march <laughs> wow it's been a good year yeah it has been now a flood of emergency calls ended up coming into a northwest sydney call center all these calls claiming that there was a man seen wandering around with a large ak-47 Ooh. No, grocer. No. Exactly. Now, obviously, nobody's going to take this lightly. Like in today, in today's day and age, absolutely not. Yeah. So authorities, all of them set off on foot. They've got helicopters in the sky. Like they are on a mission to find this man and get him in custody before he potentially harms anyone. And thankfully, they found, again, this unnamed 50-year-old man very quickly. Now, another relief, it wasn't a gun. He just had a very large bong. <laughs> what? That was shaped like an AK-47. What? Who? 
And he had just been toting this giant bong around Sydney. Who? Why would you? Are you I like? Don't know. Is it? I don't know. Like when you're taking a hit off it, are you putting your mouth on the muzzle? That's what I'm saying. Like, where did this come from? That is, is my biggest concern. Like, who made this? And it's the size of an AK-47. That's insane. I mean, and obviously convincing enough that multiple people called and are like, there's a man with an AK-47. Wow. Now, thankfully, I mean, out of all of the ways this could have gone, I'll take it. But what I found very interesting is that despite this not being a weapon, he was still charged with possession of a firearm and intimidation. Really? Because it looked enough like it, I guess, that oh. he scared people so badly and they brought out all their police force for this. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if he held it in a way where he was acting like it was a weapon, then they could still... Still mm. got him for it. Wow. Poor man probably just wanted to have a good time. You know what? If you've got a bong... It turned real bad. Yeah. yeah. If you've got a bong shaped like an AK-47, leave it at home. Exactly. Just leave it at home, man. John's advice of the day. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Put it on one of those beautiful backgrounds of like the ocean with a quote. If you have a bong shaped like an AK-47, just leave it at home. Just leave it at home, man. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> well, uh, as always, oh. our stories seem to have these weird connections, Danielle. How about a paranormal story from Australia? I'll always take it. Love some paranormal stories. This one, only from last year. So yeah, things have been getting nuts in Australia. <laughs> things are going wild. The BBC reported in July of 2022 that locals in the town of Mildura in northern Victoria saw something strange in the sky. Tammy told her children, there's nothing to worry about, referencing how the sky had this bizarre purple and pink haze that seemed to stretch on for miles. But she was thinking to herself, what the hell is that? Yeah. Another woman in town heard her parents talking. Mom's on the phone and dad's in the background going, I better hurry up and eat my tea because the world's ending. And mom's like, what's the point of eating your tea if the world's ending? I was having a big Stranger Things moment, the girl said. Oh, absolutely. She was wondering if this was the end, but it wasn't the end, Danielle. It was, no Demogorgon. It was lights for growing marijuana. <laughs> Medical cannabis was legalized in Australia back in 2016, <laughs> and apparently a new farm opened up on the edge of town. The real funny thing is that growing facilities are supposed to be kept top secret so no one can find them. They only have medicinal allowed there right now. I think they failed at that. Apparently, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, apparently there's a system of automated blinds that are supposed to come down before those lights kick on. And on that night, the blinds just failed and the lights kicked on and all of a sudden the whole sky lit up purple. <laughs> and, and everyone's like, oh, the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> like, marijuana. Yeah. When after Tammy found out what it was, she uh, said that she thought it was beautiful and thought that they should do it more often. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Maybe that's what we need in this world. Lighten things up a little bit. Yeah. Just turn our sky pink and purple. Purple skies. Well, I, exactly. I can only imagine what people think because I have grow lights for all my plants, like all my starts for the garden. Uh-oh. There we go, Danielle. I don't, so now I'm over here like, what are people thinking when they pass by my pink and purple lights? Yeah. yeah. They're going to bring their AK-47 bong over. I know. Good grief. <laughs> I'm going to end up as one of these stories. Good. Well. Well, that was an adventure. It was. That was an adventure. Uh, and honestly, I do feel like someday I want to go to Australia. Have you ever thought about it? Actually, I'm not a big person on traveling abroad. Like it's there, there's not been a place that's called out to me, but yeah. I've always had this like small desire to go to Australia. Yeah. I'm freaked out about a lot of things that want to kill you there, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like insects and all of that. But I would absolutely. I would love to go. Yeah. I would love to go to some of their beaches. I would love to just experience it. I don't know. I think it'd be fun. I want to go into the outback. Yeah. Well. Check things out a little bit. Someday. Go on my own adventure. Someday. I will definitely get out there. But for right now, we need you to decide who is going to win this month. And as much as I wish we could just 
vote for ourselves and then have some third party be a tiebreaker to make me win. You guys are the ones that get to vote who told the best Australian crime story. You can vote uh, at our Twitter account at crime after pod for the first seven days after the episode drops or. You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We always have a link in the description box below. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the letter I in the corner and vote there. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself. Or you can check us both out on Mysteria. Yeah. You can also say and you should probably do it. You should. Uh, or you can join our Patreon, shop our Teespring store. We got all kinds of stuff at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. And as always, a huge, huge, huge thank you to our patrons. We absolutely love our patrons, you guys. There's a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. We have a ton of fun over there. We just did a hot takes episode. Hot so takes. Those of you waiting for that video, it's going to be interesting. Plus, bonus here patrons get a special shout out in upcoming patreon specials so don't forget you can come and meet us plus attend our final episode it's coming up so fast danielle at crime con orlando in september of 2023 but it's going to be a lot of fun you guys come and meet up with us for the big finale I'm sure you're wondering, how do you get your name on the guest list? And also get a bunch of really awesome free crime after crime swag. All you have to do is visit crimecon.com and buy a standard crimecon pass today using the code crime after crime with no spaces. And then you email your receipt to crime after crime at lordandarts.com. That's crime after crime at L O R D A N A R T S dot com. Honestly, the sooner the better because we do have a limited number of seats and swag, so don't miss out. We really would love to see you guys there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Next time, we will be back with one of your pick. Remember, we had mm -hmm. you guys vote. <laughs> you wanted more craziest evidence, so we got craziest evidence part two coming. What do you think, Danielle? I, for some reason, knew this would be one that they would pick. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. I loved our last episode. If you've missed it, go refresh yourself. Go check it out because I can only imagine where this next episode will take us. Yep, and we'll be bringing fresh stories. Mm -hmm. The show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Holland, and the amazingly talented storyteller, John Lorden. Oh, thank you, Danielle. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And uh, we got to hit the frog and toad. I need a little walkabout away from John after that. <laughs> Have a great month, you guys. We'll see you again soon on Crime After Crime. Bye. Bye.